Uh, so how about we then sort of jump into maybe Jack, you could uh, k- kick us off with a little bit about your your background. Yeah, oh, and where sure. whereabouts are you guys? We're based in London. We're in London, right? Yeah, now, yeah. yeah. That's okay. uh, we're in Monument. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Yeah. So yeah, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm a co-director of Young Wilders with Noah, uh, and also a co-founder with Noah too. Um, with a few other members of the team as well uh, who aren't yep. in the office today, <laughs> but are also very legendary. Um, yeah. And yeah, our, so my story is that uh, I have always been a kind of nature nerd, I suppose, like got into bird watching quite young, really loved reptiles. That was probably my gateway animal. Um, was really obsessed with reptiles for a long time, had them as pets, so always went looking for them out in the wild and stuff. Um, But I would say I don't think I thought of environmentalism or nature conservation as a profession uh, for for a long time, not not until after university. So I went to university to study philosophy. I had this plan of possibly being a lawyer across my mind. Being an architect was another kind of fantasy job I entertained for a while. Um, Yeah. But then ended up uh, studying environmental studies as a master's, which was in Canada, which was like a very broad uh, course that covered loads of different things. Um, right. At that point, I was leading a bit more environmentally, but definitely not nature conservation. I think then I was probably thinking of it as maybe being a policy job. I was studying um, uh, chemical pollution at the time. So I guess I was thinking about that a lot, uh, which is also like a, obviously a massive environmental area. But uh-huh. along uh, kind of alongside this development, this group of friends so Noah myself and uh three others were talking about rewilding um as this kind of really exciting new moment in nature conservation um yeah yeah, being like really caught up in like the vision of it and the kind of wonder that it it, like intends to stir um Mm -hmm. and I think the the fallout from those conversations was that we really wanted to do a rewilding project um and I think at the time we were thinking of it as being just a hobby. Uh, well, definitely we were actually um, thinking of it yeah. as being just a hobby and wanting uh, to quite self-interestedly ultimately do it sure. uh, while we were younger so we could see the fruits of our labor in the future. I think we had this image of us <laughs> right. all like walking through a rewilded landscape hand in hand, looking at the birds singing and stuff. And being like like, like a, new, a Garden of Eden sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so that I mean that was a yeah really compelling fantasy, and that's it. and that we've noticed in other people that similar kind of images drive other people to get into this space too. Um, but yeah, so we started doing it as a hobby about two years ago, almost exactly actually two years ago. Okay, no, I started doing it full time. Um, I had been working as a chemical pollution researcher briefly after my masters, um, mm-hmm. and but doing this alongside, and then it became apparent that. I guess two things one that it was possible to do it professionally so the practi- practically speaking it was an option and then also okay. I think we started we had been in the rewilding uh, space at like as hobbyists for long enough to notice that we felt like there was something that we could bring to the broader field aside from just a single project that we've been kind of talking about today mm. um and that was partly a spatial thing because most of the big organizations at the time were focused on larger projects. And we right. met a lot of really interesting people who wanted to do smaller community things. But right. didn't feel like they had the resources or the help or like the skills. And so we felt like that was something that we could kind of help people with, like sm- smaller kind of projects weren't getting the attention. Okay. Um, and then... So, uh, so possibly, I think so that's... Yeah. Sorry. No, no, you go. So no, I was going to say, yeah, no, I think that that's quite interesting, and I and I want to get into into that story of how you took mm-hmm. it from from the idea. Um, yeah. But just uh, on Jack's background, you're Jack. Mm-hmm. You're more the technical um, person in the team. Is that correct? So no, no my that's yeah, me. that's Noah. Yeah. Sorry, so, um, Noah, my mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's I right. Can, I can give you my background if you want. Um, yeah, that'd be great. I'm Noah. Um, I kind of probably got into the space more from like, I'm like a science nerd, mm-hmm. more than right. like a nature nerd, I'd yeah. say. Um, and so it was kind of entering into the like sustainable energy, like climate space mm-hmm. more right. where I saw myself when I was younger, probably. Um, and then I started working for a, a couple of years as like an environmental engineer, um, mm. which is just kind of where I landed. Um, right. So I was lucky enough to work on a few really interesting, like river restoration and like wetland creation 
projects. Yeah. Um, from like a very technical like design side, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. then I started to really see the benefit of like nature based solutions mm -hmm. and um, yeah, the kind of power of those projects. Um, yeah, right. And that was and then that helped inform some of the early parts of our work because mm -hmm. um, water is obviously like one of the main considerations in all of it in all of our projects and how that works yeah. and there is like a yeah, technical sure. component to that Massive, yeah. um and yeah so then that's kind of how i got brought into it and like jack was yeah. saying in our, in our first project mm. like i was leading on like some of the um river and wetland side of things um, yeah and yeah okay yeah it's really cool. So, I'm picturing now when we when we had this first mm, chat in mm, Ruskin Park, just kind of near where we were living at the time, mm, and um, I knew Noah was like kind of in the market for mm, a job shift and was interested in kind of focusing more on the kind of nature really nerd side of things mm, rather than like just the technical stuff. Mm, and it was a yeah. really legitimizing moment for us to have Noah join because having these kinds of skills is like indispensable mm, to doing the more kind of yeah complicated ecosystem work. Mm, um, so I'd say things didn't yeah really kick off until Noah fully joined, mm. which was yeah like two years ago now. Mm. Okay, and so so picking up on the story, uh, yeah. I, I think it's interesting you mentioned the word legitimacy there. Like like yeah. you know it was it was sort of like a bunch of friends doing something, but then at some yeah. point it started to become something real, and like mm. like you started to think about maybe becoming an NGO. Uh, what right. what uh, how did that happen? What was that mm -hmm. sort of yeah. journey? I guess maybe one thing to mention um, is that we're registered as a non-profit um, as opposed yep. to a, a CIO. So there's like two different yep. kind of non-profit registrations in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, one is like would be traditionally referred to as a charity, which is like the CIO stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the non-profit yep. um, term tends to get applied to CICs, which is what we are. We mm -hmm. kind of function ultimately as a charity in the sense that we have charitable mm -hmm. aims and we rely on donations and trusts. Um, right. But yeah, just good. Yeah, good to good to mention that publicly, so we're not beguiling. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, the uh, I guess the the legitimization process was part. I think it was honestly mainly a demand thing. I would mm. say that we we never we responded to the kinds of responses we were getting where people were like we mentioned people were reaching out to us small landholders asking for advice mm -hmm. and for a bit of guidance and then as we built up a bit mm. of a kind of internet presence we started getting more attention from young people because we were realizing um one of the big things that was missing in the field was mm. involving young people in the movement in a more substantive way, because we'd had some uh, involvement in these other nature organizations that are doing fantastic work, but that the youth yeah. involvement can sometimes feel like a bit of a box ticking thing or a bit of a bolt on. And I guess we had a vision and this is, we've like developed this sense obviously, mm. but we had yeah. a vision of wanting uh, young people to be much more substantively involved in the movement and to have their voices heard and to make decisions on projects. Um, even if that means the project's done kind of slower and more clumsily, but there's just something really important about mm. like the kind of emergent generation being as involved as possible, especially given that we're going to be dealing with the consequences the most of like any generation, us, us and younger. Um, and then also there's just a massive desire to do this kind of work. Like the, there's, we've mm. got some stats that we throw around about like, I'm going to slightly butcher this, I think, but four and five young people don't feel like they're in the UK, that's 16 to 25, don't feel like their environmental voices are being adequately adhered to. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a stat, but we've also noticed it anecdotally as well, that people like really want to help and get their hands dirty and stuff. Mm. And I guess, well, I, so, like, yeah. I, I, I read on your site, I thought it was really cool, 80% of young people are eager to take action. So pretty much yeah, everyone yeah. wants to do something. Yeah. But only yeah. one in five believe that they're being listened to that's on environment, yeah, yeah, environmental yeah, issues. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah man. That, that's, yeah, um, I'd be so fascinated to see what that statistic would look like in generations gone by. Mm. Um, we couldn't find any survey data on that, but I we sure. kind of imagined that the eagerness to act would be much lower just because being less attuned to the issues. Mm. And like, yeah, I suppose that would probably be the primary reason um, but yeah, people would like young people really, really want to like yeah. get 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 stuck in. It's like yeah. a huge ball of energy, which we felt like right. is being completely ignored. And mm. well, not completely exactly, ignored, yeah. Yeah. but like not being fully harnessed. Definitely. And yeah, talk about like true sustainability in any sense, mm. in any like work, like walk of life. Mm -hmm. If it's not involving 
young people yeah. in a very real way, yeah. it's not going to right. carry yeah. on into the future, yeah. and like, therefore, like, can't be considered like fully sustainable. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. See, see, this this is this is one of the things I find quite interesting about this sector. You know, we there's a lot of talk about like decolonizing um, mm. NGOs and mm. and ensuring that the local people in the NGOs mm. are, you know, mm. everything's being community led. You know, and generally that's referring to how we in, in, um, interact with the South, right? Yeah. The, yeah. The, but South. Um, we, we can't even do it in our own communities. So, you I, know, I, I think we got to start home at home first and yeah, figure that out no, I, before we, we can worry about that. Agree. No, absolutely. And I think and just an, another kind of like parallel point to that thought is um, a one big advantage of focusing a lot on the UK for eco ecological restoration is that our ecology at the moment is a total train wreck, like a real like global embarrassment. One stat we use is right. bottom 10% on earth in terms of ecological intactness. And I don't think people in the UK really think of ourselves like that because we have mm. like our countryside's a bit green or like I, I, I'd be guessing right. as to why, mm. but people really don't understand it as being like the devastated landscape it is. And that massively, aside from all the obvious reasons, that's bad it really invalidates our voice on the global stage because we can't expect like any kind of, I don't really know how politics works. I was going to say diplomat, but any like representative of the UK abroad, their mm. voice is like not going to be adhered to by any country if they're like, what's behind them is just a smoldering wreckage. Mm. So it's a proper like sort yourself out first kind of focus, which mm. feels kind of sensible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. It feels sensible. It's like a natural mm. law that, you know, you got to lead by example, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, I want to get back to your story. Sorry, but um, yeah. the the thing with the the youth in the UK not mm -hmm. feeling like they're being listened to, why yeah. is that? Why do the young people feel that? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got a massive like problem in the UK of like access to the countryside. Yeah, a few very big landowners mm -hmm. owning like most of the country. Mm -hmm. Um. Like, yeah, like, I think that it's not necessarily a welcoming, the countryside isn't the most welcoming place in the UK for yeah. young people or yeah. for people who don't, haven't grown up in the countryside. Yeah, um, sure. Like we've lost, uh, again, I, I would be making up the stats, mm. but like the co common land in the UK has yeah. basically been com like completely taken away. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been really alienated from the way our landscape mm. works. And I think that's reflected in why the UK is especially bad at this mm. kind of thing. I would say another <laughs> component of this, which probably applies more globally, is the thought that just as a general rule, you know, decisions and stuff tend to be contained in more experienced echelons of, of society, mm. which as a kind of a rule of thumb is pretty great. You know, I'd rather mm. have an experienced surgeon working on me than like a beginner or whatever. Mm. But I think in the environmental context, that same kind of philosophy just doesn't apply in the same way. Because mm. firstly, there's like the generational justice thing that we touched on, which is just that young people have inherited this like decrepit landscape and um, aren't being given a chance to fix it. So there's like, yeah, that kind of justice thought. But then like Noah mentioned this like mm. ball of energy thing. There's like a real practical case for doing things mm. in the way we're doing it. Because we're getting emails every day from young people who have the time and they have the energy. Mm. And the thing that's great about rewilding is that like it's it's technical in some senses, especially in the kind of water area that Noah tends to focus on. But sure. also the knowledge base is quite easy to grasp and it's mm. fairly intuitive that we do some quite complex work with volunteers, sure. for example, who aren't trained as ecologists or conservationists. They just love nature and want to see it thrive mm. and stuff. So those kinds of reasons for excluding young people don't apply. Um, and then uh, I would also just say there's a bit of we're at a kind of a turning point in terms of cultural momentum in the UK. So we, so we work a little bit with Rewilding Europe, who are, who are a fantastic organization. And mm -hmm. one thing that we've been told by them a few times, which I, I find fascinating, I can't fully explain, um, but I'll still I'll still try. But they they have so there's lots of obviously lots of countries are part of rewilding Europe. Rewilding is has is a very low momentum movement in most parts of Europe. It's mm -hmm. like politicized in a lot of toxic ways that are just totally needless. It's become like a cultural thing, or it's just not on the agenda at all. Whereas in the oh. UK there's young people are really, really engaged and involved and appreciate it in a way that isn't as true in other countries. And I think Noah and I chat about this pretty often. I like, and literally earlier today even, and our main kind of running theory as to why that is, 
is um, that we've had some insanely charismatic and productive like advocates in the UK, which Ooh. some other countries haven't really kind of benefited from. So right. like, most of the people that we talk to have read say feral by george monbiot or wilding by isabella tree they're these like core rewilding texts that are very uk focused very widely read kind of like mm. bestseller level widely read mm. so there's just mm -hmm. a fluency ab about what it is as a thing and how important it is um so yeah we've got yeah so everyone's kind of really attuned to the issues in a way which isn't as true elsewhere so i think that's probably that's probably part of it as well yeah no absolutely mm -hmm. yeah uh, that's fascinating. I, I didn't realize that that was the case. I, yeah, I could also see though. You know, I mean, for instance, in France, um, France is, uh, I think, less, slightly less um, populated per square meter yeah. than the UK, yeah, right? Yeah. So there's, and then it's also quite decentralized. So, so mm. everything's a little bit. There's, there's a little bit more wilderness, I believe, here. Yeah, I 100%. think I'm not sure. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's, um, a, that's an interesting thought too, because I think there's like, a, I think another reason why young people are a, a very like useful force in the UK is because the UK has had this very particular degraded landscape for quite a long time. And there are all these thoughts in the rewilding movement about how we've inherited and then aestheticized the landscape. And there's a thing called shifting baseline syndrome, which comes up often where people have kind of accepted the natural damage that's happened and it's been kind of processed as just the way things are. And I think in sure. every sector, young people are uniquely well-placed to be almost revolutionaries because they can like look at the world with fresh eyes, much fresh more eyes. big, like, yeah, kind of ideas that involve a lot of change basically. Mm. And um, this new generation is coming in informed in this way that we were just yapping about by all these new rewilding ideas. And they can see that the countryside is in, really dire need of like major changes in management in a way that maybe older generations who are more used to what they're looking mm. at are probably like less well placed to kind of get stuck in with okay and and so talking about fresh eyes and fresh perspectives mm. you know the work you guys are doing from my yeah. perspective uh is a reflection upon of that yeah. um so can you talk a little bit more specifically about what you guys do um you know about the rewilding pro projects the yeah. different kinds of projects uh, yeah. and then yeah. maybe so a little bit about how you involve the youth because uh, yeah, you touched on it be before but i'd love to understand you know exactly how mm -hmm. you're getting uh, them involved for sure yeah so um yeah just going going back a little bit to like the start of our story i think it's helpful we basically started as like an instagram page yeah. and like an internet <laughs> yeah. presence of being like yeah. we are a group of young people who care about this yeah that was kind right. of all it began as. The and then one landowner um uh in on the border of surrey and sussex reached out um mm. to us and was like i'm thinking about doing this on my 40 acre plot mm -hmm. like would you be interested in coming in being a partner mm. and right we obviously jumped on that opportunity yeah. um yeah again this is all like hobbyist mm. um sure. and we set up something that we call like a, a youth-led mm. um rewilding or nature recovery project yeah that was like our first Kind of proof of concept mm -hmm. um right. and essentially the way we we do that is we um set up the project like as it's where we try and involve young people at every single stage yeah so from including the in our planning um, mm. in our, oh, okay. um implementation in our yeah. management um yeah. Yeah. so every um so when we're doing a plan for a project, we'll mm. have young people shadowing, mm. inputting that like into mm. the decision making project, mm -hmm. and then um, all of our implementations are done with these big volunteer days, yeah. um, right. where um, we might be planting trees, mm. or we might be doing soil sampling, or yeah. tearing down fences, mm -hmm. um, and then yeah. yeah, on 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 that project, we've like built a big. Um, outdoor classroom out of some um old materials that were left on the site mm -hmm. um and now that it's a bit further down the line we're also doing all of the monitoring of the project is mm. being run as like um lessons in how to do surveying mm. and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. in that sense it's like we're trying to make sure at all points in the project yeah. it's doing two things at once yeah. right like so we're, we're, we're monitoring what species are on the site and how we've made an impact 
but also trying to involve young people in that process and teaching them how that works yeah um, yeah right that's kind of one example yeah um, one like really cheesy way we've recently been conceptualizing that yeah. kind of determination to use every opportunity as like an upskilling and involvement lever is that we we're rewilding land like we have a bunch of projects the acreage isn't huge but like there's an amount of like nature we're bringing back just through our work but then the <laughs> the cheesy phrase that i'm hesitating to say because it's so cheesy but is uh um, rewilding like a generation because <laughs> yeah. i think we have we like we need the we need young people to it's not just a nice thing to do and it is it is a really nice thing to do but we need loads of young people mm -hmm. who understand how this process works we need loads of young people who have the skills to execute it we need them to know each other and for there to be a community and for it to be a fun place that they want to be right. as well which, which is a massive part of our work as well so I guess we're kind of trying to help build like a young nature nerd army that's going to help the UK kind of get things back to where they should be. Yeah. And so, yeah, so we, like we are saying, we did this this one project. Um, at this, it's called Maple Farm. Yeah. And it's been a huge <laughs> success. Mm. And then like following on from that set success, we've had lots of other landowners reaching out to us, basically asking us if we can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, by building our online presence and running a few um engagement events mm -hmm. um, like we run an annual festival and yeah. we're always doing talks and webinars and mm -hmm. things to put our name out yeah we've got a bunch yeah. of young, young people from all around the country asking to get involved mm. so we now kind of have access to these two balls of energy yeah um, for the first time and yeah. so now we're, we're now we're taking on as many projects as we can possibly do basically yeah, yeah. so we're currently running um 10 nature recovery projects uh mm -hmm. all around the country mm. um sp starting off mainly in southeast england but we're now trying to we're trying to spread as as much as we can mm -hmm. um and they range from some are more like woodland creation mm -hmm. some are more like grassland restoration mm -hmm. river restoration mm -hmm. um wetland creation mm -hmm. um I think I missed anything out. Yeah, um, flower meadow stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, one, one of the, when I saw you guys on mm. Leave Curious, um, yeah. What what I liked about it, I mean, there was a lot of things that I liked, but you were mm. talking about doing hedgerows. Yeah, and yeah, love, what what I thought hedgerows. was really cool mm. was, I mean, I I get the idea with hedgerows, but. I'd always mm. had this idea of rewildings like this big, huge, massive thing, you know, and then there's yeah. wolves are going to come back and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. this, you know, massive yeah. thing. But yeah. the way you guys were doing it, it, it was suddenly so much more accessible, right? 100%. And made sense. And I thought, yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah. On that also, yeah. uh, I, I thought Rob, Rob's next video that he did yeah. was a, yeah. was a reflection on, rewilding as a concept right yeah yeah and and i kind of felt like oh i bet that he was influenced by you guys yeah no it's it's uh it's a really big topic um and i think a lot of the rewilding success that we've seen in the uk that i was mentioning mm. before in terms of movement momentum has been yeah. a willingness to play the cards as they're dealt because there's attempt to like the kind of gateway drug for rewilding as i yapped on about in that video is the like big predator reintroduction. It's this vision of these right. massive untouched landscapes mm. and all that kind of stuff is incredible. And to the degree that it inspires yes. people, it's like worth its own goal. Um, yeah. But I think uh, in England, especially Southeast England where most of our work happens, but then also in the rest of the UK, there's really specific like economic, like kind of agricultural, like um, just regularly cultural uh, constraints um, and there's so much awesome work you can do within those constraints that it feels kind of crazy for them to stop you. I mean, the hedgerows is really the dream example of this process. There's lots of others, right. but hedgerows is great because it takes up such little land. So it doesn't, it doesn't right. remove income for farmers. It's also in a way that I don't f fully understand by nature of not being a farmer, but also really good for farms. Like it helps with erosion right. and it can protect things from the wind. Mm. Also yeah. like brings pollinators to farms, which is obviously really helpful. Yeah. Um, and it's really fun to do. It's like a mm. hell of a day. We've done like maybe right. eight or nine hedgerow planting volunteer days, and it's insanely fun. Mm. And then you get another thousand trees minimum in the ground for a day. So it, it really is like one of those rare like win win wins. Mm. Um, and at least we've noticed anyway, specifically just on the hedgerow point, that the 
public understanding of the importance of hedgerows has gone up massively in the last few years. Mm. And we've been right. working with a bunch of different organizations whose whole MO is just to do mm. the hedgerow networks around England. And that alone yeah. will bring back incredible amounts of like farm farmyard birds and all these kinds of species that have been declining mm. over the last 50 years. So that's like a really yeah productive um, and currently uh, underway positive nature story we can report to any interested parties that the hedgerows are going back in the ground and it's yeah. something to celebrate and it was like it was uh, at least for us as like young people with when we started this with no money and no aspect and no access to land yeah our, the first thing we ever managed to do was planting a hedgerow yeah because yeah it right. requires very little sign up from yeah. the landowner yeah there's lots of ways to fund it yeah um lots of grant schemes yeah. um and yeah. it's something you can do with volunteers with very little skill yeah so, yeah i guess to your point about just getting cracking with doing things yeah that was where it's we first great... started because yeah. yeah we had all we had all the skills we needed to do it mm. and all we needed to was i don't know yeah just, just to do it just yeah just yeah. to get yeah. cracking absolutely mm. yeah it's really hey, cool. hey I'm, I'm conscious of time have you guys got mm. a few more minutes because i've got a couple yeah more sure. yeah, yeah. yeah cool mm -hmm. so what you were talking about there about was was the funding um mm. how did that how like where are you guys getting your funding how, yeah where did you first start thinking about funding and and was it easy enough to sort of get the yeah. initial funding and then from there yeah. to get something that that's regular because you know mm. one of the problems with with um uh, conservation work is it's the funding's yeah. often project based so how do you yeah. maintain a team so how did you okay. sort of get over that hump or have you got yeah. to that hump? I can, I'll maybe make a more general point and then I'll hand yeah. the reins mm. to Noah because Noah is the one who's really been in the funding mm. trenches and all of that. Um, but yeah, so the, the general point I'd make, and this is a point that I've yapped about um, kind of to anyone who will listen over the last few years, is that when we were when we were first kicking off and we were chatting to as many kind of older conservationists as possible to gather a bit of seen wisdom, uh, a sentiment that we heard a lot was that you guys are in a very, although there's obviously lots of stuff to be concerned about, like the nature, nature now is in a much worse state in the UK than it was 50 years ago, for example. But the, the really good news is that public support is here for nature in a way that's never been true previously. Like the kind of hearts and minds have been won in a certain sense. People like appreciate its value as, as a thing and as a profession to help it. And then also to your funding point, there's, there's money available for this kind of work in a way that hasn't been true ever before. Um, okay, which has been cool. fantastic. It's been the wind in our sails right from the start and it's made Great. our organization possible. I don't think we could have founded it 10 years ago, for example, and certainly right. not before that point. Um, in terms of the slightly more kind of fiddly uh, grant stuff, like I mentioned, Noah has been leading mm. the charge on that. And there's been like a yeah. kind of, there's been a bit, there's a bit of a division, like you mentioned, between mm. projects and yeah. core costs. Yeah. I think yeah, when we started, we were obviously all just volunteering our time. Um, and working off of project grants, like the yeah. first yeah. grant we got where, from like the Woodland Trust and mm -hmm. like that's something anyone can access. Mm -hmm. um, their More Hedges scheme was the first little yeah. few thousand pounds that we managed to access. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of similar schemes like that um, mm. all across the country, yeah. really. A the lot Tree of, Council have got a good one that we've used a yeah, bunch. Yeah. Um, so we found it quite easy to access like mm. capital cool. funds to make so to buy trees yeah wildflower seeds yeah um yeah you know, a few bits and bobs of materials we yeah. need yeah. but like you say it's i mean we've we've only been officially a, a cic for two years and mm -hmm. the, the funding is always a major challenge yeah. Um, yeah but i think that where we've been successful in like the philanthropic side of things mm -hmm. um winning some core cost grants yeah um, i think that climate change in general yeah is such a huge and expensive problem yeah. <laughs> yeah. that we were finding more and more people were saying actually with our mm. uh, few thousand pounds yeah. we could probably do more in the bio in the biodiversity space um yeah yeah and so we've had a few um yeah a few funders who've been supporting us like as an organization yeah and like to cover our core costs who, yeah have really focused on that side of things yeah, um, yeah. and see the value of yeah. community work in that space. For sure. Um, 
those problems yeah. obviously often come hand in hand as well. Um, yeah. And although we're more focused on biodiversity, just by nature of like creating mm. land uses that absorb more carbon, we're kind of we're helping with climate mm. stuff too. Um, another uh, to just wind on one more moment about the kind of kind of current momentum slash like wind in our sails stuff is uh, the biodiversity crisis hasn't really been getting as much attention as climate change. Mm-hmm. And actually, this is a, it's a really interesting thing, because when I, when I was working on chemical pollution during my master's, one thing my supervisor would often say to me is that the kind of the public consciousness on environmental matters and probably other ones too, moves like in vogues and like it kind of latches onto certain issues, but often because people have all kinds of stuff going on in their lives, obviously can't hold more than a few like major environmental challenges in their head. So maybe it was like save the rainforest in the 2000s. Apparently chemical pollution had a big moment in the 90s when my supervisor was first entering the space. And then I guess last 15 years, climate change has been kind of top of the agenda, uh, right? like rightfully so. Um, but we've been noticing um, at the kind of micro level that Noah just mentioned mm. and like macro in terms of media attention and stuff that the biodiversity crisis, which is also massive and has huge ramifications outside of just nature, uh, is getting a lot more attention to. And that's been really awesome. Yeah. But also, yeah. yeah, I think as, as a small, a small nonprofit funding is the limiting factor of everything that yeah. we do. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, yeah, we're still learning in that, in that space. Yeah. But um, yeah. at the moment we're, we're doing we're doing okay we're doing we've okay. just started to manage to grow our uh, grow our little team to have a few yeah a few more amazing young people work yeah. with us so yeah, yeah. Um, we're really excited about that yeah no you guys have done a really incredible job and it's it's cool it's good to know that there's easy enough money to access to for those beginning projects to get started yeah, i mean the so. next stage is another thing altogether um yeah. and, and maybe sort of you know thinking about re- wrapping up this this conversation yeah how do you guys think about sort of going forward and sort of scaling mm. up your your impact and mm-hmm. and what do you guys have planned how do you think yeah. about that yeah for sure so i guess um we've spoken a lot about like the scaling thing because it's it's not always clear it hasn't always been clear to us whether it's our role as a small organization to try and scale to meet these large problems or whether we're more helpful being a kind of niche organization and like helping working with bigger ones when we can and stuff like that. But I think as Noah was mentioning how we were kind of our own test case of like young Mm -hmm. idiots who wanted to do nature recovery and then like found a way to do it. I think we have this dream now, which we're developing more seriously. Uh, We're calling it our Wild Stewards program at the moment. Um, And there's kind of like beginnings of it on a few of our projects. But basically our kind of end game dream at the moment, and this is what the next few years is going to be dedicated to, is having a system in place where we can, we have all these messages from young people, like keen, like people who just like want to get stuck in. And these really lovely messages from well-meaning landowners too, who want this work to happen. And we want to have like a really slick system in place where we can be like, okay, like you're from Warwickshire. There's three other young people in Warwickshire who want to do this. There's an awesome project just down the road where a farmer's giving over an unproductive, unproductive field to some like forest regeneration. And I know you want to learn about that, whatever ends up being and just putting people in touch and basically functioning as a kind of facilitator. Mm. So we want to kind of like repeat ourselves like Mm. across the country as much as possible. Um, and at least early signs that that is uh, like could work as a system are really good. Mm. Um, and it's going to mean that our kind of challenge as an organization is much more of an organizational one rather than say like a kind of technical environmental one, which it has been up to now. Um, but yeah, I think we're really, we're really excited for it. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, I think that's going to be, that's the dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I would agree that, like with your analysis, that would be the, the the appropriate way for you guys to scale your impact is to do it like that, like to to get other groups exactly like yourselves and help yeah. them to get up and and have thousands of little groups like yourselves. Yeah. You know, I mean, I kind yeah. of uh, this is a bit silly. I liken it to like the the rock bands of the seventies, like your, oh, yeah. your groups of individuals. <laughs> you know, all with slightly yeah. different styles and different sort of approaches, but all mm-hmm. sort of linked by the same kind of cultural um, momentum. So to yeah, speak, yeah, that's, that's also a way of thinking about it. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, mostly we've we've just learned so many lessons in the last couple of years um, that I think if we could give to other groups of young people as early as possible, yeah, they could go on to do even more than like we've managed to do in the last couple of right. years. Massive. So like that's kind of 
the dream. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And part the stuff we learn the hard way and kind of spread it in like a mechanistic, but still kind of like warm and fun way. Mm. <laughs> and just right. get, yeah, get those tools out to as many people as possible, as mm. quick as possible, basically. Yeah. And I think that's important, the, the way you guys are going about it. You know, there's, mm. it's fun, right? It's, it's not... Yeah. Oh my God, the world's going to die. We need to do something. Yeah. No, no, you guys are out there yeah. having fun and it's it's about Definitely. living life at the same time, right? For sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is it is just an incredibly fun thing. It's a really mm. joyous yeah, right. process. It's a really joyous process. Um, and like everyone that has we've worked on has loved it too. So there's, it's just, it's an amazing thing to be able to like spread just at the sheer kind of fun level as well. Yeah, cool. So look, uh, Again, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. If, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to come back and talk to you guys again in six months or so and yeah. sort of see how things are going. Yeah. Um, and like you say, you know, yeah, I've, uh, you'll see I've, I'll be posting other conversations with other people. If there's anyone you want to meet that I know, um, yeah. just let me know. Uh, yeah. If I can help in any way, I, I would love to. Um, but, uh, yeah, congratulations on everything you've built. Um, it's really exciting to see see you guys grow thanks so much yeah, thanks really so much for talking it. to us yeah. really nice. thanks guys